Good morning, folks. We're going to take the next few moments and welcome one another and get ready for a wonderful service all focused on Hope Floats. And it's good to see each and every one of you.
day, God is good. And here we are this morning worshiping with you. I'm with Mark Zelke, who I think was born for such a time as this. Little bit Billy Graham, little bit romper room. He's uh, rocking it. We are so lucky. Friends, we are all treaty people, and as a nation of newcomers, settlers, refugees, French, English, indigenous, and Métis, young and old, with reverence, we share this land known as Treaty 6. Grateful for the thousands of years indigenous people cared for this land and for all of creation, honestly seeking to share it with us. And may, may we as treaty people live with respect for the past and hope for a just future that we share. Our bedrock belief this morning is that faith in God gives us hope. God alone can satisfy. And there are hard days and nights of heavy lifting that are familiar to the people of God and the people of faith. And these stories come around and we know them. But we can say to one another with confidence that faith in God gives us hope. And as I light this Christ candle, I remember that it grounds me and it centers me and it connects me to the generations that used to gather around our community table and light this candle on Sunday mornings. That we are the light of Christ in the world and that we are connected more now than ever. For we need this light shining brightly in our lives. Okay, folks, we're going to sing, so if you have your instruments, I see James and Alex and Annalise and Heather and many others. If you have your any noisemakers or instruments, your voices, your morning voices, get them on in here and let's worship together. Here we go.
Folks, let us join our hearts together in prayer. Holy One, whose name is love, continue to be with us as we worship you scattered in place. May we who are simply inconvenienced remember those whose lives are at stake. May we who have no risk factors remember those who are the most vulnerable. May those who have the luxury of working from home remember those who must choose between preserving their health or paying their rent. May those who have the flexibility to care for children when schools are closed, may we remember those who have no options. Some of us have had to cancel trips, but we need to remember there are those who simply have no safe place to go. Some of us have lost some of our savings to the tumult of the economic market. And we are called to remember those who have no money at all. Some of us have settled in for quarantine at home. We are called to remember those who are still out there on the streets looking for a home. And as we all struggle with the fear and the reality of this time, let us still choose love during these days when we cannot physically wrap our, round, our arms around each other. Let us find ways to be the loving embrace of God to our neighbor. God, help us to remember our Advent faith, the lessons of patience, of waiting. Help us to remember our Lenten faith of journey and deep connection. And God, help us to remember our Easter faith of new life and transformation. And for all time and in every place, we cling to the words that Jesus prayed. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Whispers tenderly, in quiet moments, God whispers tenderly. 
church. 
Right. And even once, I wore a hockey jersey. And you know, you would think that would be okay. Today, of course, you know, we, everybody is included, everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter who you are, what you look like, what you're wearing. And it's interesting because that is something that I believe we have been able to change. I remember coming fairly early, but you sat very quiet. You that didn't is true. socialize, you didn't socialize, you didn't mingle. Um, you didn't really greet people. I you, think I got a slap. You sat very quiet with your head kind of bowed in reverence, preparing, you know, your heart for worship. A few of the things that came to my mind was, um, and this is sort of before our time, but way back when, I don't know, 200 years ago, the church was quite comfortable with slavery. So, so we can see we have made leaps and bounds in understanding our theology and what we consider to be living out the mission of the good news in the world. Open table. Open table and also a common reading for the common person. Yes. Of the word of God. That we are allowed to read scripture. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think about the presence of children in the church and how much that has changed. Um, I think of the babies who wander uh, around our congregation and how that is just like a normal, you know, very, um, very a, a approved habit of children wandering. Well, we have some we have some answers here. So Cheryl Wilkins says. It's been a wonderful change. Um, I love the way that children have become important and vital. Nancy Maloney, and, and by extension, of course, Garnet. Uh, the sounds and ease of children amongst the people during worship. I got pinched once, this is Nancy speaking, for being squirmy <laughs> and not sitting, the, sitting perfectly still and silent. Yeah. I can identify with that. Even us drinking coffee in church would have been unheard of. Please do not go. It would have been unheard of to bring beverages of any kind. Like, we didn't even have water. Um, I'm thinking big things. Um, loving affirmation of queer and gender diverse people is a huge step in transformation in our Christian community of faith. The apology to First Nations people about the harm that was done to them through residential schools. These are great big milestones. Um, the inclusion of divorced people in um, in the community and, and remarriage. There are so many things that we have experienced already in the culture of the church and we have adopted and, and taken in and incorporated them into the way we live and be God's people in the world. So that's kind of the background and the, the framework of the message I'm going to share this morning about Paul and the very early beginnings of the church. Rev Deb, just before you go on to scripture, there are some there are some comments here that I think are worth noting. Jim Ferry, bistro tables <laughs> in the in the back. That was a huge deal. Huge. Um, Maddie Burns, well, even when I was looking for a church, I worried about every different church's conception about rules and about having a child run through the worship center. And that's just a wonderful thing. You know, Gilda, one of, our, one of our worship design team, says, I'm old enough to remember when women and ministry was a huge topic of discussion. Yes. Or Ellen says, needing special clothes. Ah. Yeah. Yes. Debbie Bathgate, this is, you know, we, we always talk about mental health. And Debbie Bathgate, I love the way the church has become tolerant and understanding of suicide, mental illness, divorce, gender, gender and sexual issues. And Absolutely. That's significant. The, it, it, these, are, um, these are ways that we integrate our authentic selves 
and not just the people God calls us to be, but the people that we are. Um, loved, claimed, forgiven, made whole by God's love and, and by the care and tenderness of a community of saints. So change is the name of the game. And we are people of a resurrection. And, and so we continue to experience those growing edges and those growing pains of, of what God demands of us in this time and this place. I'm reading this morning from the a book of Acts. It's basically a detailed travel narrative of the apostles um, spreading the news of God's love, spreading the stories of Jesus' life and ministry, his suffering and his death throughout the ancient world. And so wherever Paul went, he was known as the emissary to the Gentiles, but wherever he went, he proclaims Jesus to the Jews. He goes to a synagogue in town if there is one. He reads the Hebrew scriptures and then shares the story of Jesus. So this is Acts 17. After leaving Philippi and passing through Amphipolis and Apollonia, Paul and Silas came to Thessalonica. There was a Jewish synagogue there, and as he had done in other cities, Paul attended the synagogue and presented arguments based on the Hebrew scriptures that the anointed one had to suffer and rise from the dead. Who is this suffering and rising anointed one that I am proclaiming to you? It is Jesus. He came back the next two Sabbaths, repeating the same pattern, and some of the ethnically Jewish people from the synagogue were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, and even some devout Greeks who had affiliated themselves with Judaism came to believe, along with quite a few of the city's leading women. And seeing this movement growing, the unconvinced Jewish people became pro protective and angry. And they found some ruffians hanging out in the marketplace and convinced them to help start a riot. And soon a mob formed and the whole city was seething with tension. The mob was going street by street looking for Paul and Silas, who were nowhere to be found. And frustrated, the mob came to the house of a man named Jason. Now he was known as a believer, and they grabbed him and some of the other believers they found and dragged them to the city officials. The accusation was this. They are political agitators, turning the world upside down. They've come here to our city, and this man has given them sanctuary and made his house the base of their operations, and we want to expose their real int intent. They are trying to overturn Caesar's degrees, and they are saying that Jesus is king, not Caesar. Of course, this disturbed the crowd at large and the city officials especially, and so they demanded bail from Jason and the others before they were released. But the believers waited until dark and sent Paul and Silas off to Beria. And when they arrived, they went to the synagogue, as was their custom. And similarly, in the first chapter of the first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul and Silas and Timothy are writing to the church gathered in Thessalonica. Those living in God the Father and in Jesus the Anointed One, may God's grace and peace be yours. Paul writes, we thank God always for all of you in our prayers. Your actions on behalf of the true faith and your tireless toil of love and your unfailing, unwavering, unending hope in our Lord Jesus, the anointed one before God and the Father, that you have put consistently at the forefront of our thoughts. O oh, sisters and brothers by God, we know that God has chosen you, and here is why. What you experienced in the good news we, that we brought to you was more than words channeling down your ears. It came to you as a life-empowering, spirit-infused message that offers complete hope and 
and assurance. We live transparently before you so that you would know what sort of people we truly are. And we did it. And you have modeled your lives after ours just as we are modeling ours after the Lord. You took to heart the word we taught with joy, inspired by the Holy Spirit, even in the face of trouble. And as a result, you have turned into a model of faith yourselves for all the believers in Macedonia and Asia. In fact, not only has the message of our Lord thundered from your gatherings, but everywhere we go, your faith in God is talked about, so we don't even have to say a thing. You see, they go on and on telling us the story of how you welcomed us when we were introduced to you, and how you turned toward God and realigned your lives to serve the one true God, leaving your idols to crumble in the dust. And now, we await the return from heaven of God's only Son, whom God raised from the dead, namely Jesus, our rescuer from all that is to come. Hear what the Spirit has to say to us on this day, and may God bless to our understanding the readings of our holy scriptures. Amen, amen, amen. These stories about Paul and Silas, Peter, James, and John, and Timothy, this is a snapshot of the earliest beginnings of what we know becomes the church. The disciples, who are called apostles now, are healing in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. They are preaching, they are teaching, and they are spread out as far as they can imagine going. There is serious conflict, and while they are gaining confidence in their message and in each other, they are rubbing up against the Roman regime and the Jewish authorities. This is heavy lifting and tough times, but the gospel has been released. The good news is on the move, and this is the first time we hear from Paul. We have skipped over his epic conversion story, and we find him on the front lines, seeking to open even wider the mercy and grace of God. And Paul is personally convinced that his message is to go west. Go west, young man, and he is far out in the world, on the edges of civilization, preaching in synagogues, and where there are no synagogues, he just preaches on the lake shore. He is speaking to people who have never even heard of John the Baptist. They have never heard the story of Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, who suffered and died and rose on the third day. They are all punching above their weight. We know the story of Stephen, who is actually killed. And there are many stories of close calls. There is imprisoned Peter and Paul. They're getting into all kinds of trouble. And the official accusation from the authorities is that they are charged with turning the world upside down. What a mess. What a disaster. Essentially, they are convicted of disturbing the peace. The best laid plans are overhauled by the Holy Spirit and by the power of the risen Christ at work in the world. In our lives, in the media, in the stories we watch on our TVs and phones during the week, we see all kinds of crazy protesting. We see people who are not, in fact, turning the world upside down. They are being irresponsible. They are bringing negativity and violence. They're bringing destruction. But in the early work of the church, these very beginning places, these pockets of believers and converts, small groups of resistance, they were seeking the opposite of corruption 
and violence. They were choosing to live in love with one another. They shared their wealth and their possessions. They provided for each other. And they believed that God alone could satisfy our hearts. They were learning to live in hope and believe what Paul said to all of them. God chose you. You are mine, God says. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will bring about the kingdom. This kingdom of freedom, of justice, and mercy. At this point in the church, there is no building, no scripture, no book of prayers. Just people scattered in place, struggling to believe in a new thing. Coping with misinformation and stress. As they cling to the hope that it can get better. They do not have the Gospels. They haven't been written yet. There's no story of Jesus. There's no amazing grace and no old rugged cross. Suffering is still a thing. It's still a part of the story. And there is tension when groups of people start to begin to hope that things can be different. Paul says to them when he leaves, I'm leaving you in the hands of Christ. I'm leaving you on your own. There's no leaders, no schools, no scrolls, no building. But what you have is each other. You are chosen, claimed, made whole by the risen Christ, and you are filled with the Holy Spirit. This is how the early church was given birth. Paul provides pastoral care to these newfound communities, initially by visiting them and teaching them and living with them, but later through letters, offering encouragement and hope and strength from a distance. And Paul's words provide the bulk of our Christian scriptures. The words I read this morning from 1 Thessalonians are understood to be his very first letter. We read them on this day, and it's hard to believe and understand that Paul was sharing the story of God's love, known in the life of Jesus, to people who had never, ever heard the story before. And as he says, some people believed and some people didn't. Some people embraced the opportunity of new life, and some people resented it. And yet they continued to keep on doing what they were called to do as followers, no matter what. Along the way, they found supportive friends, helpers. They prayed together. And with divine intervention over and over again, Paul's mission to the Gentiles succeeded against every odd. Despite the shipwrecks, the disasters, the storm, the strong tides, the gale force winds, hope floats. And hope continues to float today, despite mass shootings, despite violence towards women, despite a fallen helicopter, despite our frontline workers dying while serving others in need. In the whirlwind of a pandemic, hope floats our way, and hope is there to cling to. A couple days ago, I saw this wonderful clip about a family that hired a bucket truck. You know, like a utility truck or something like that, with a bucket on it. And they parked it so that they could go up to the fourth story window where their grandpa was in the hospital. They wanted to see him through the window to let him know that they remembered him and they loved him. Who would have ever predicted that you could do something like that? Who would have ever thought it would ever be necessary? But if you can imagine, and if it brings joy, and it offers life, that life-giving transformation, then you are indeed bearing the good news of God's love for the world. This is not a time of polarities or extremes. This is not a time
time to divide us up and to say there are some who will sink and some who will swim. This is a time for us to float. Use a pool noodle or a life jacket if you need to. But we are floating together down that lazy river. Struggling and suffering are still a thing. But we know how to manage that. We've managed that before. Because just like those communities, in the very beginning of the church, when the world was turned upside down, just like them, we still have each other. And filled with the Spirit of God, we know that we are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are a family of faith, and we join our hearts together to pray for each other and to pray for our world. Please join me. Gracious God, we find you in ordinary moments of our lives, watching the crocuses bloom, listening to birdsong, breaking the dead grass. We find you in these little moments of joy and celebration, anniversaries, birthdays, anticipating graduations that will not be celebrated as we had expected. But disappointment is not the same as despair. And we struggle with the loss of these special moments. And a life of faith and a life that follows you does not eliminate the pain. But we know we have support and our burdens are shared by the one who says, come unto me. For those who are concerned about their health, concerned about finances, concerned about work, for those who are worried about children and grandkids, who are worried about your aging parents, we offer our prayers to you, O oh God, knowing that you are the God who hears our prayers. Knowing that you wrap us up with your love. And you consider each one of us to be important. Laid, commissioned, chosen. We offer to you this day all the struggles, despair, and loss that each one of us knows on this human journey. We remember that some pain reminds us of other pain. And may your healing love, may the tenderness of your ever-present spirit give us wisdom and courage and strength to face the days ahead with grace and with your mercy. Pray these things in the name of love. Amen. Let's join in song together and take up his song. Take up his song of peace and go into the world. Take up his song of peace.